So this is lightning talk time, guys. So, ladies and gentlemen of the Open Source Universe, are you here? So the goal of the question was to hear a yes, but uh, are you here? Yes! So as the ones of the previous ver version of this workshop knows, I'm a fan of the yes, so I'm a yes man. So I need to hear your yes because at, end, at the end of each uh, lightning talk, I want your yes. And it's, if it's a no, it's like yes. If it's a big yes, it's yes! So I want to hear a big yes. Yes! yes. All right. So lightning talks is easy. It's three minutes, each of you. So all the presenters, be ready because it's going to be fast. Daniel, you're the first guy. All right, you're here, so prepare your, your slide. Do you have slides? No. Okay, cool. You go. Uh, you have a... I'm just going to open up the... Here. It's just here. Oh, it was... No, here. it's the... Uh, that one? No, you double check here. Oh, okay. And oh, okay, thanks. So this is Daniel Chivis, introduction to Metasat. You have three minutes. Tell us what it is about. Three minutes. Okay, so um, I'm Daniel Chivas. I am a research fellow at the um, Center for Astrophysics at Harvard University. Um, so on Monday, we went over um, what I have. Uh, basically, I asked everyone to create their own schemas for various use cases for our, um, our metadata schema for small satellite missions. And so real quick, I wanted to show everyone um, what we have already existing uh, for the schema. So we broke things down so far by use cases. Um, we don't have a general schema yet. It's just too ambitious. The project's really only like two months old at this point. So um, I found it easy to just break things down by uh, different levels for now. Um, so on the observation level, so you could think of this as a, let me zoom in. as uh, scheduling an observation, for example, on like the SatNogs network. Um, we have, I would say, about three different high levels of entities existing. So we have, starting at the observer level, um, we have information on the observer, uh, basically contact information. This is all very simple. Then we have their ground station, which includes, a, a lot of these elements are SatNog specific, um, since we're implementing our schema on their network first. Um, but they're just like a different, bunch of different elements for describing a network um, ground station. And then we have the mission observed um, level, which includes um, mission people, which was one of our example use cases that you guys worked with. Um, this is also pretty simple. But then we have spacecrafts, which we really need help with. So this is, our, we're having a workshop after lunch um, in this room. Uh, so we hope, we're hoping that people can help us with this section in particular because, um, well, my area is information science. I'm not an, an engineer. Uh, so I'm kind of just winging it with this, uh, just trying my best to learn it. Um, but so, so far I've divided this up into about three different main groups. Uh, comms, nav, and uh, payload. So within payload, we have instrument, which is kind of an overarching um, category. Uh, so let me show you. So for comm equipment, this identifier here connects to the instrument identifier. Um, I'm not sure if you could see this or not, but um, but then in comm systems, we have things uh, basically just the hardware itself. We have link parameters. Um, and some other uh, telemetry stuff. And we also have a navigation system, I mean, uh, entry, which includes things like TLE, um, another identifier. That identifier links to the instrument identifier, and then we have our orbital parameters. So uh, that's it. So during, after lunch, if we could swing by, we could um, maybe work on this stuff together in this room. Uh, thank you. Yes. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. So, for Daniel, what's your yes? Yes! Awesome. So, next to come is Ilias. So, we don't... 
you want, you want? Ah, oh, to uh, do the one because yeah, but now he wants. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm still a bit dizzy. Uh, Anita, I finished your beer. That was maybe too much for me. Okay. Um, you, you go. You, uh, you start now. I start now. I just need a minute because uh, I actually presented the tool yesterday, but. Um, I mean, it's like I'm, 30% of your time. Right? I'm really impressed by uh, life hacking and what Juan Lu showed us yesterday. So what I did is um, last night I prepared the, uh, this binder so you can run the, um, uh, the, the notebook without installing anything. And I did this now for this uh, link budget tool, link predict. So you go to the uh, repository, you launch the binder. And uh, oh yeah, I forgot this will usually take a bit uh, of time. <laughs> so maybe I need my three minutes, but um, the nice thing about this is, yeah, that um, if it's prepared well, and it took me a few iterations because I always forget to update, uh, th there's always these tricky things for the setup.py file, um, like, do you know that if you put something on pip that, and you have subfolders, that you have to, uh, to take care of this, this is a bit of a quirky thing. But the, the thing is, you go there to the website, uh, you launch it, and after, I don't know, two minutes or so, it shows up. Okay. The docs? The log, okay. Yeah. So the, the thing is that it's, it's creating uh, this environment for you um, every time that, that you go there. And then here are some of the examples that I presented, um, was, uh, showed a bit code yesterday, but the nice thing is you can go there now and execute them and reproduce these results and, and change uh, things. There's also one example where you uh, plot, uh, you have a plot, etc. So I think it's really cool and I like uh, this interactive hacking. We should have more of this uh, in the workshop, I think. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you, Arthur. So, your yes for Arthur and this uh, link uh, budget tool? Yes! Awesome. So, now, Elias, this is really for you. So, what happened to PQ9 ish and the cubic story? Elias, you have three minutes. Okay, thank you. So, what's up with PQ9 ish? Uh, there was a bit of a silent period uh, during last month. Uh, actually, we were uh, getting uh, ready to use uh, our comms hardware on a high altitude balloon, so it's like an intermediate step to uh, do some testing and verify the platform. Uh, since there, was, uh, there wasn't uh, any upcoming uh, mission in the near future, and uh, then it was. So this is cubic mission. We found a slot uh, for 1P uh, pocket cube. Uh, to get lands in the low Earth orbit around 300 kilometers, and uh, the time frame is quite tight because I think like uh, next end ne end of next month we should have uh, flight, hardware. flight hardware. Now uh, the good thing is that the comms part is uh, in a very good state. The EPS uh, the EPS guys are wor working on that, and uh, we also needed a mission concept. So except from testing the platform. Uh, we're going to try to uh, perform early ob orbit determination uh, from the RF sin signals we're going to be rece receiving through the SATNOGS uh, network. So we're going to try different modulations and some CW and use the Doppler shift and try to determine the orbit like before even NORAD knows that we're up there. Um, then there was uh, some... Uh, progress on that uh, one of the teams that were uh, also in the deployer with us dropped out. So now we get to send two uh, one pay satellites. And also the guys that were building the deployer told us that we cannot build the deployer. So we ended up building also the deployer for the mission. And uh, well, this made things a bit, you know, adrenaline rushing. Uh, the lunch is expected, uh, I think, uh, near the end of February uh, on a Firefly rocket, which is a, a test uh, rocket, a test ride for their uh, vessel. And uh, we hope that this will not happen, but there's a good chance 
Anyway, it would be really, it will be really interesting. And uh, that's a cubic mission. Thank you. Just, just like back. Ah, yeah, of course, sorry. <laughs> okay, for the PQ9-ish story, and for Elias, what's your yes? Yes! Awesome. So now we have Konstantinos Kanavuras. Konstantinos. Konstantinos. Creating and managing tons of documentations. You have it. Awesome. Yeah, so, uh, hello. I'm a, the I'm a member of the uh, Acubes of Project that presented earlier, and uh, we will also apply to the Flagger Satellite Program by ESA, and one of the requirements is that we provide them with tons of documentation, so everything about uh, test reports, experimentation, uh, design reviews, uh, rationales, uh, everything like that. So uh, up until now we have more than 100 documents, and we like to find a way to manage them efficiently, uh, and we need to find a way to do that that is easy to use, uh, that's not time consuming, and that produces consistent results. So we don't want any formatting uh, troubles and uh, ugly doc documents. So I would like to ask you uh, what kind of software do you use to write your, your reports, your PDF files? So for example, Microsoft Word or uh, Markdown. So raise hands or just shout what software you use. LaTeX, LaTeX okay. LibreOffice, Confluence, okay. <laughs> Microsoft Paint, okay, uh, okay, okay, that's awesome. So uh, we opted with La uh, LaTeX, so for those of you who don't know, it's an open source tool, you write code and uh, it gets translated to PDF. Uh, it's uh, really awesome, it's a bit hard to learn, but uh, it's actually easy once you get to know it. Uh, now, the next step, uh, we copied all the great organizations that had documented in files, so we do the same thing as well. For the ne next step, uh, we copy the cool hipsters that use uh, DevOps and Slack. So there, there's this thing called integrations and Slack commands. Uh, we have an interactive uh, environment where users can uh, select what kind of document they want to create for which subsystem, and they get back boilerplate LaTeX code, and uh, they get back uh, a document ID, so they can just plug it into Overleaf, which is a web-based IDE for LaTeX. So they just write what they want to write, they get back their PDF file, no need to install anything, uh, no need to learn anything. There is also a rich text editor if you don't want to learn to code, so everything is ready. And then we put all of that uh, inside the web-based uh, UI, uh, UI, so this is it. So say I want to learn about space debris, so I write debris, and uh, I see this report here. Uh, I click it, and they see everything. I can browse it, I can read it. Uh, how do I go back, hello, yes. So, and this is what we get. So this has been uh, a tremendous help uh, because we are a project of two years or two and a half years and we get new members constantly and uh, we need people to, to see what we have done. Uh, we need to see what we have done in the past. Uh, we need to see tables and reports and all of this stuff and it would be awesome to, awesome to see uh, other uh, CubeSat admissions. Uh, there have been no, some already, but it would be great to see other missions uh, use a structured documentation style and get uh, other members of the community to know what steps they took to get to the place they are now and uh, what is the rationale behind the decisions, what are their errors, and uh, how they progress. So that's for me. Thank you. All right. So for Konstantinos and managing tons of documentation, what's your yes? Yes. Awesome. So now we have Mr. Pieros Papadias from the Librospace Foundation is going to introduce you the Librospace Manifesto. Pieros, the stage is yours. So I get to time myself. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Three minutes. No, seriously. I'm going to keep it super, super uh, short. Uh, so the concept is that basically Librospace Foundation was founded uh, almost five years now ago. And uh, initially, I mean, we have a vision, we have a mission, right? But we needed a larger uh, and wider adopted text. So we ended up together uh, with uh, all the core LSF contributors to draft what we call the Libre Space Manifesto. And this is available now on manifesto.libre.space. And uh, the Libre Space Manifesto includes a set of principles on what we want to see in outer space moving forward with regards to uh, specific aspects of outer space, and namely that all people shall have the right to explore and use outer space for the benefit 
and in the interests of all humanity. Number two, exploration and use of outer space shall be carried out collaboratively. Number three, that outer space shall be used exclusively for peaceful purposes. Number four, on profit should not be the driving force for space exploration. And number five, all people shall have access to outer space, uh, outer space technologies and space data. So those are the guiding principles. This is where we want to go, right? And we also needed a, a part of the manifesto to speak about how we go there, like how we achieve um, those principles and how we move forward with, um, with them. So this is what we call the pillars. Uh, and for the pillars, we ended up with four distinct um, guidelines, basically, uh, which is open source, and that's related to all technologies developed uh, and published under uh, permissive open source licenses. Uh, then open data, that all data related to and produced in outer space shall be freely used, shared, and built upon by anyone, anywhere, and for any purpose. Um, Open development, that all technologies for outer space shall be developed in a transparent, legible, documented, testable, modular, and economical way. And this is really distinct from open source many of the times, because that relates more on how you develop uh, the technologies that you do. And finally, open governance, that all technologies for outer space shall be governed in a participatory, collaborative, direct, and distributed way. And this is obviously, I mean, it's it's a manifesto, right? Like it's an aspiring document uh, with a vision on what we want to do. Uh, and the concept is that we want to pledge uh, this manifesto for all the technologies that we develop and we create uh, on behalf of Libre Space Fund, uh, Foundation. Um, but also we want to get support, uh, get feedback around it, get co-signing from other individuals or organizations, or companies, or institutions, universities, groups, teams, um, whatever uh, entity uh, you are or you represent. Um, it would be great uh, if we can get this Libre Space Manifesto published more widely and also uh, supported. And most importantly, build your projects around it, uh, pledging uh, to those ideals in terms of principles, but also the pillars. Um, this is the first time that we presented um, openly and was published uh, last night also on the community.libre.space. That's the community forums for Libre Space projects and other projects too um, that live on, on our forums. Um, and we are looking for early feedback around the core document, but also suggestions on how to make it more actionable. Um, how we can get, would it be co-signing, would it be just merge requests, uh, adding uh, items on who supports it or not. Um, and those kind of uh, publishing issues basically around that. So, yeah, that's it. It's out there now. So, yeah. All right. So, for Pieros and the Manifestos and all Libre Space Foundation, what's your yes? Yes. yes. Awesome, great. So, do not hesitate to use that. So, next on stage is, uh, is Davis. So, right from the Anaka space from. Nice. From Portugal, right? Yes. Porto. So here you have a link. And I'll let you play whenever you want. Opa. Can I put sound on it? Yeah, I think there's sound. Is there sound? And then, here's your presentation. Okay. Can I'll um, tap. Um, so, isotopic pirates on the moon. Okay, have you seen this, um, this uh, sketch from Futurama? Where in the first episode they go to the moon and he finds that uh, it's just, just a, you know, a cheap, uh, sleazy, um, um, uh, what do you call, festival uh, parlor. Okay, so for, uh, for uh, Fry, everything is new. Uh, but for them, the, it's, it's just, you know, comedian. corrupt, uh, usual, um, common day uh, life. So that's what we want to do. We want to make space and go to, to the moon and make, uh, you know, wow. it's like going to I the weekend, uh, really going to, um, to, um, to, um, to a shopping mall or something like that. But the problem now is that uh, what is the, um, the thing that um, motivates... Um, 
why, why we should go. Uh, um, Mister, could you please get those keys <coughs> out for me? Where is the need to go like to space? And uh, it's mainly mean uh, engineering and uh, building stuff, but uh, there's nothing that space uh, can't provide that we find up uh, already on Earth. Um, no one knows where, where, so, uh, or how. Man first landed we have found, uh, we have, um, uh, two years ago, we went to a um, hackathon uh, in uh, Teza, big uh, business incubation center. It's not pirates, it's whalers on the moon. Well. It's not how it happened. Oh, really? I don't see you with a fungineering degree. <sighs> this is stupid. I'm taking this thing out to the real moon. Fry, no. This is my first mission, and I'm not gonna let us get in any trouble. Besides, the car's on a track. Not for long. So, um, we wanted to, uh, to find something that you can only do in space. Nowadays, we can only, uh, of one application I know, is uh, making uh, fiber optics, which are, um, which are uh, refraction free in all the optical um, um, uh, window. Um, but uh, we wanted to, uh, to find something, and um, there was on the big, uh, on the, the business and the acting space contest, Hackathon, um, uh, um, a challenge from the Taiwanese um, space company to, um, to uh, find something that you could only do on the moon. And we came up with the idea that you, uh, the only thing that you can do in the moon is to do, and uh, do it cheaply, it's uh, isotopic separation. Um, from the, so from that idea, what uh, we had to build up uh, and make up a case and uh, have a bootstrap way of going to the moon. So we started to do uh, the idea to make a first um, 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 <coughs> isotope separation by the classical method of um, um, Mass, mass spectroscopy, spectroscopy, uh, which you fire. Okay, and and um, then yeah, and um, uh, the idea was first to make an instrument, fly it there, then you, uh, try to use the regolith and use the, the isotope can to uh, fire and make it a, a propulsion system and maybe sell regolith to uh, satellites on, the, on geostationary orbit so you could keep them uh, flying and, and being on their position from using uh, already um, the regolith from the Rhone. And then from that, you could build an um, isotopic refinery, which would be, uh, we imagine it would be like that, uh, as you can see. And uh, Sandra now will uh, try to explain the, the idea and the concept behind it. In 30 seconds. Okay, this is just a, a dream, and a, uh, we imagined uh, several uh, transportation cars uh, that are moved by solar energy, uh, taking the regolite, the soil composition, the powder, the soil composition of the moon, taking to to uh, to again. Uh, that would, uh, that would uh, shoot that uh, powder and uh, according with the uh, atomic mass of each element, the, each element would, would, would uh, uh, deflate, have a, a different deflection and would be separated from the others, which means we would get different um, elements and even different isotopes. This is a very well-known um, technology, uh, mass spectroscopy, but in the moon we would have uh, many benefits. For instance, we wouldn't have to, 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 to have a clean room. Uh, moon has no atmosphere, so no need to, to take care about that. Uh, we also have less concern with gravity because the gravity is one sixth of uh, of the Earth's gravity. So, yeah, nice, nice. So you're separating isotopes on the moon? Just uh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Just uh, I would I'd like to to note, make Finish, notice yeah. why this is um, uh, a need for, because every time you increase the purity of, of anything or increase uh, an order of magnitude uh, the um, 
the quality of, the, of your stuff. You, you, uh, every, um, all new kinds of applications and technologies uh, appear. Uh, nowadays, we are witnessing in physics, for example, the, um, uh, seeing um, uh, quantum mass effects, bulk effects, and uh, if you could just work with the same isotope in an experiment, for example, um, you could probably see lots of uh, new stuff. Okay. So, okay. If you need more details, go to them so they know how to separate isotopes on the moon. So if you need to build anything, they, they provide the matter. All right? Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So for Andre, Steves and company, what's your yes? Yes. Awesome. Andre, Sandra, thank you. So next on stage is Dimitri Ostupis. So you're here, awesome. Right. Yes. I don't know if you have anything. But I don't have any slides, so I'm going to open some pages now. Or just All right, so Dimitris is going to talk about HR helper tool, which uh, uh, HR, I don't know what this is about, but human resources. human resources, right? Okay, cool. So we'll see how it relates to space and open source eventually. So Dimitrios, the stage and the screen is are yours. Yeah. Yes. Wait tw ten more seconds and I'm gonna finish. <laughs> oh yes, of course. Nice. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, no, that's not the one. That's the one. Okay. Uh, hello, I am Dimitris. I am a member of CubeSat and uh, I am mostly in OBC, onboard computer. I don't want to focus now in uh, the technical aspect of things. I'm going to focus more in the more like a human factor in the, in the whole team because we are all motivated, we're all working, we're all hard working and um, you usually sometimes overwork and burnout is, uh, is a fact actually that we cannot, we, we underestimate, you, we usually underestimate. And uh, the reason I'm making this talk is to raise awareness about this, this thing that uh, we realize that we're overworking when we finish a project. And uh, that's very devastating for our psychology and stuff. And we can use some tools for us to help in, uh, like, aid in the process of getting more, uh, getting easier in a project. Like, for example, see, uh, here I'm, I'm just so showing the data, the statistics we have for our lab. And this comes from a thing that started as an idea of who wants to be, like, we want to know who is in the lab and we just have a check-in system and we, we know that such a member is a lab, uh, another member is not in the lab. This is a very simple idea, but the results that, you, that came out of it are like priceless. You can use these results actually to see, and uh, for, especially for people who are working with code, you can correlate with the commits, you can correlate with uh, the amount of work they do and see the productivity, have a correlation of the productivity over the lab time that is spent, because usually when, some, when people spend more time in the lab, actually they're less productive. And usually when they spend more time and there are more people around, they're even less productive. So by having this correlation, we can make uh, an open source, of course this is all open source, we can make an open source system for HR management uh, and actually improve our health in a project. Uh, because that's a major factor that is underestimated by everyone. We, we see it, it's near us, but we don't want to see it actually. And uh, that's, uh, that's, that's a tool that uh, we developed. It's all, uh, it's all open source, it's based on Grafana, of course. Uh, we have it in our, in our uh, team's repo there, so you can find all the code there. Nice, all right, thank you. So for Dimitrios, and I hope you put the link to that uh, on, the, on the chat. For Dimitrios, what's your yes? Yes! Awesome. So next on stage is Jordan. Thank you, Dimitrios. <laughs> so Jordan Trevitt is going to, to tell us how you can find radiation tolerant parts, right? And what oh, yeah, difficulties kind of. about it. Uh, do, do, do. Number nine. I just have all this one okay. slide. <laughs> That's all. Uh, yeah. 
Well, we've been talking, I've heard several talks talk about ha having higher liability, hi liability systems and uh, wanting to have your CubeSats last longer than one year. Uh, personally, I actually work at uh, what was formerly called PT Scientists and uh, now called, well, just PTS. Uh, but I also work with AMSAT and they also wanted, wanted a lot of more radiation tolerant parts and uh, well, they wanted their satellites to last because people use their satellites for many years. Um, so uh, these are just some of the basic uh, databases that I'd recommend looking at, some of the NASA ones and the ESA ones, CERN, and there's also some commercial ones uh, from uh, DOEIT. Well, I'm not sure, I mean, I'm not sure how to say that, but uh, some other ways to actually find some of these parts um, is just look at some of the radiation tolerant uh, parts themselves. The radiation hard ones, and uh, look at the part number. If you look at the part number, you can actually see some of the commercially available parts already that are already in some of these uh, uh, catalogs, like uh, from analog. Uh, you can see plenty of LDOs that are radiation hard. Um, however, there's actually some tests from NASA with the iris radios on the Marco, uh, where some of these LDOs are still radiation tolerant up to 35 kilorads. And the thing is, with radiation tolerance, it's not really finding the extremely hard radiation parts for the CubeSats. It's more trying to find probably something above 5 kilorads, 2.5 kilorads. It's to last a little bit longer. It's, and uh, this is just the basics for, at least for kilorad stuff. And there's some other databases that talk about the single event effects too. Um, but uh, with uh, C's, you can usually actually deal with that with more redundancies. And uh, you can always buy more expensive parts. Uh, and also, don't be afraid to reach out to vendors. Uh, if you're a university project, they might actually be willing to give free, rad, hard parts to you. So be willing, just ask them. Don't, don't be afraid of them. <laughs> they don't bite. And yes, they are expensive, though. Uh, that's commercially, commercially, yes, it will be expensive, though. It just, you have to keep that in mind. Uh, otherwise, it's the expense you actually have to pay. Otherwise, it's just mainly in manpower and searching. But that's always trade-offs, always trade-offs. Um, and that's pretty much it. So if you want to take a picture, you can. But uh, this one's pretty nice. But. Thank you, Jordan. <laughs> Thanks. For Jordan, all the links for the databases. What's your yes? Yes. Great. So next on stage is Mike for ground se segments as a service. Right. So uh, there's uh, no presentation. I got no slides from you. Yes. Uh, I blew it on the screen. You can have a, you want just a dark page? Or? Okay. Three minutes. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, I'm Marek Sedláček. Uh, I'm from Space System Czech and I would like quickly introduce uh, our projects uh, which we are uh, doing for ESA. I mean, it's co-founded by ESA. Basically, we are building a new mission control system, uh, but it's not only about the mission control system functionality because we are also incorporating uh, design of uh, uh, reference architecture for designing a uh, ground station. So do we need uh, another mission control system? And I would say yes, because we are bringing our knowledge uh, from uh, working on a large uh, satellite projects. We are listening to the CubeSat community. For example, we are cooperating with University of West Bohemia in Czech Republic, uh, uh, which operates uh, Vezetelu Sat 1, CubeSat, and uh, we are apply those uh, in creating a new uh, ground segment application infrastructure. So uh, let's see, this is just uh, some basic building blocks, uh, as you can see in the, in the yellow box. Uh, this is the scope of our project, uh, uh, which, uh, which will be developed. Uh, so you see, uh, we doesn't provide only 
monitoring and control services. We also provide mission preparation tools, some uh, distribution uh, system and things like that. So why we are different? Because we are building on top of uh, ESA's existing applications, which we are extending and streamlining interfaces. So for example, we will provide a REST API and WebSocket interfaces so you can easily connect your automation tool. Uh, from the beginning, uh, we will natively support uh, CubeSat protocol and MO services, and I think that we will be uh, the first uh, mission control system which will natively support mission operation services. Uh, which is like a new way how to operate spacecraft. And if you are interested more in this uh, concept, uh, you should check OPSAT mission, which will be launched uh, soon, like uh, next month. And uh, I see uh, that many blocks can be open sourced. Uh, some, uh, uh, some blocks cannot be totally open sourced because we are, uh, like ESA has some permissions which don't, don't allow to publish everything, but uh, we see, uh, for example, great opportunity, for example, in those functional extensions. Uh, I got inspiration from yesterday talk uh, about a NORAD ID assignment, which uh, could be, I think, developed as kind of module for our system, because we would like to help automate this process uh, for uh, initial tracking of uh, satellites, which is newly inserted to orbit. So uh, let's build something uh, which will be uh, useful for everybody. And if you would like to cooperate with us in the design phase, so you can reach us and uh, even you can join us and work together on this uh, open source project. So thank you. Thank you, Marek. <laughs> so for Marek, uh, trying to open source all the boxes of ESA, what's your yes? Yes. All right. Thank you. So that's the last of the lighting talks this morning when I took this t-shirt on. Uh, I washed myself in the mirror because I can still see uh, the below my belly. Uh, it's written like empowering the world with open source, right? And I was thinking, oh, we're here like empowering the universe. So we're just extending this part in the upper like school. So, uh, so uh, a big yes for all of you. And that's your yes. So go ahead. Yeah.